students. Man, it's the best day of the week right here. I would love to sing a melody over the room right now. And if you know it, I'd love for you to join me. It goes like this. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me down Cause I put my faith in My anchor to the ground My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me down how sweet it is when someone keeps their word. When someone makes a promise to you or says that they'll do something and then lo and behold, they do it. It means you can trust them. It means that their, their character is worth something. Now on the opposite end, it's very bitter. It stinks, it sucks when someone breaks their promise. Because what that means is I can't trust you. You're, you're not worth my faith anymore. Now what this song is saying and where you can see me going with this is we have reason to celebrate in this place uh, because we serve and worship and follow a God who keeps his promises. When he says he'll do something, he does it. It's in his nature to do so. What that means is he has earned our trust. He is a promise keeper. Jesus is a promise keeper. We're gonna sing one more song that celebrates that. And as we do, let it be a celebratory matter to say, thank you, God, for keeping your promises. Because what that means is I don't have to worry anymore. Who can add a single hour to their life by worrying? I don't have to, because Jesus keeps his promises. Would you bow your heads and hearts and pray with me? Let it be known, Jesus, that you're the promise keeper. Your word is true. You are the anchor of our lives in this storm called life. You are the cornerstone of the house we build. You are the foundation of our souls, Lord. It is only on you we place our trust. It is only upon you we place our faith we celebrate the promises you've kept, that you're keeping, and that you will keep. If you know it, let's get loud. God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out.
faithful God Always have been, always will be We place our trust in you today, Jesus, come on students I put my faith in Jesus my, to my hope and firm foundation what students come on thank you so much for singing with us students it's a truth worth singing you guys may return to your seats Hey, it's good to be together. I just want to let you guys know I'm proud of you. Every single week, prioritizing gathering together in this place, worshiping together. It's incredible. It's awesome. I, I flash back as I think through it to the very first time I ever went to church. 17 years old. Maybe you've heard this before. My brother invited me, and I remember sitting in the back of the room, and the music was stuff that I didn't understand. Some of the words in the music, I was like, I, I was confused. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know what was going on. But the part that kind of tripped me up a lot was this communion that they did. The first time they were passing these trays around with a little wafer like what we have, a little cup of juice. And the guy was up there talking about Jesus, saying a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't understand. And then he said something that threw me off. As he's getting ready to pray, he said, hey, as, as we prepare to eat the body of Christ and drink the blood of Christ, and I'm telling you, man, my mind was blown. I'm like, this place is crazy. This is weird. I have no idea what's going on. And I remember going repeatedly, and it always tripped me up and until probably a month or so later. I was talking to this guy, Rick, who was one of the pastors there, and I said, Rick, I don't understand the communion thing that we do because that's definitely a cracker and grape juice. And, and he's like, dude, check this out. This just, it's something that we do that represents Christ's sacrifice. He said, it, there's nothing special about the stuff. He goes, it's not like actually blood. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I kind of got that, you know. And he started to explain to me, he said, hey, here, here's the deal. It's a reminder for us of the gospel message of Jesus, that God loved the world so much he sent his son to us. And he said, God demonstrates his love to us through forgiveness. And he shared this scripture that I'll never forget, Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he went on to explain to me, he said, hey, in God's language, Love and forgiveness are the same. It's the same. And I was thinking about us, how we gather up in here. 
we take a little bit of time to do exactly that, to remember how much God loved us, that he sent his only son, that us imperfect people can be forgiven and have a relationship with God. It's through Jesus. It's the good news of Jesus. So as we take this time right now to continue to worship him by remembering that God sent his son Jesus for us and that's how he demonstrated his love. I want to invite you to have that heart to heart with him. To spend a few minutes just to lean in and maybe you could approach it a couple different ways. Maybe it's a time of thankfulness, being reminded how good God is. For maybe some of us that were maybe not there yet, maybe it's a few moments to take, take an opportunity to pray, maybe for the first time to ask for his forgiveness because God loves us, he created us, and he wants us to have that hope and joy and that peace in our lives. And I wanna pray for us as we do that. God, we come before you in this space thankful that we get to gather, thankful that we get to be reminded of your goodness. God, we thank you that you demonstrated your love to us through Jesus, that we can come to you imperfect broken sinners and invite you into our lives. We're thankful for that. Thank you for forgiving us and for showing us your true love in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, 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 how we doing tonight, CCV? Hey, I, I, I want to share an epic fail story with you, if you don't mind. March 31st, 2009. I'm a sophomore in college. I'm a baseball player. 
I'm playing on a team called the Arizona State Sun Devils. We are the number two team in the country at the time. We're playing against the number one team in the country, Cal State Fullerton. I'm standing on second base. We're down by one run in the eighth inning. And I decide I'm going to steal third base to get our team in a good position to win the game. Seems, seems good, right? Problem is, if you've ever been to a baseball game, there's this guy over on third base called a third base coach, and he gives these signs that tells the hitter what to do, tells the base runner what to do, and I decided that, man, I really want to steal third base to help us win the game. That's a good thought. But at ASU, we have this thing where if the, the third base coach, he gives these signs and he gives you something that maybe you don't like and you want to steal the base, you can have a hot sign which what you do on the base is you flash for a green light, and if the coach flashes back to you, he's saying, yeah, you can steal the base. So, first pitch goes by, coach puts on the signs, I'm like, coach, let me steal. He bends down and he, and he pits, picks up some grass, and so I, I don't steal. Second pitch, he puts on the signs, I'm like, come on, let, let, me, let me steal the base. I got this. He bends down, picks up some grass. I don't steal. Third pitch, I'm like, coach, I got this, come on. He bends down and he picks up some grass and then it clicks in my head. He doesn't wanna do this because he, their dugout is right behind him and so what he's doing, when I ask for the green light, he's bending over and he's picking up green grass. Makes sense, right? And so I just go with it. This happens in a matter of a couple seconds, and I say, I'm going. I start running. I slide into third. In my mind, I am safe. I'm gonna be the hero. Umpire looks at me. Out! I look at my coach. About 5,000 people in the stands booing, not me, my coach, because they think he put the sign on. I can't tell you how bad that felt. I walk back to the dugout. This is where it gets worse. I look at the head coach. He goes, hey, go take a seat. Next hitter gets a base hit. We would have tied the game. We end up losing by one run, and I had to wear it all. But this is where it gets really worse. At the end of the game, our head coach calls our team into the huddle, and this is what he says. He says, guys, we're a pretty good team. We're pretty good. But if we're gonna be a great team, a team that can beat that team over there that we just lost to, we can't have guys like Newman making up signs in key situations of the game. He said, guys, if we're gonna be a great team, a championship level team, we have to find unity. Man, I can't tell you at how just crushed I was, how bad of a teammate I felt that day. But I have a question for you. Have you ever thought about this room this huge room and all of us in it as being one team. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you've thought of like your individual group that you sit with and your coaches as being one team and you guys sign up for stuff like cage match and you guys go to group time. But have you ever thought of this team, this campus, as being one team? Probably not. Well, we've been in this series called Ephesians, and what we've been doing over the last three weeks is we've been looking at a guy named Paul, one of the head coaches of our faith, and we've been looking at the first three chapters over the last three weeks. Let me set those up for you. Week one, we talked about how this is a team that you don't have to try out for. Every single one of us are chosen to be a part of this team. Week two, we talked about this thing called God's grace. It is by faith that we are saved, not by works. 
And all we have to do to be a part of this team, the church, is to accept that free gift. Last week, cage match week, week three, we had a conversation about this thing called urgency. That because of this free gift of God's grace, we should have an urgency about us to live our lives sharing this good news of Jesus with other people. And because of that good news or that urgency, we should have freedom and confidence. And what we're gonna do tonight as we look at chapter four of the book of Ephesians is we're gonna dig in and we're gonna see Paul, the head coach of the churches of Ephesus, one of our head coaches, He's gonna call us into a huddle and he's gonna tell us if we wanna be a great team, what we need to find is unity. So let me dig into Ephesians chapter four, verse one. This is what Paul says. He says, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. This is what he's saying. He's saying, hey, I'm literally in prison right now because of the way that I'm serving the Lord. And so, hey, listen up, team. I need you to start living the way that you're called as well. I need you to unify. He goes on in verse two to say this. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. It's clear. He's calling us to unity. I love how the message version puts verses four through six. Let me read those to you real quick. It says, you were called to travel on the same road in the same direction, so stay together. Both outwardly and inwardly, you have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you think and do is permeated with oneness. Okay? So if we're a team and we're called to be one, what does that look like? Here's a visual that I got from one of our pastors here at CCV. He talks about this all the time. When we talk about being one team, we can be one where maybe we wear the same shirt, the same jersey. Maybe when you look at a roster, we're all on the same roster. But what Paul's telling the people of Ephesus is, hey, that's not being unified, that's not being one team, because I see the way that you're interacting with each other. I see how maybe this guy believes this and this guy feels this way about this issue. You're not really one team. The second level of this is we can be one, Maybe we're on the same roster. Maybe we have some cliques, some people on this team like, man, we're on the same page. And over here, maybe these people on the team, they're on the same page. But when it comes to the collective group, we're not really on the same page. What Paul is calling the people of Ephesus to and what he's calling us to, every follower of Jesus to, is to look like this. And that's to be one. And I don't know if you caught this, but when I read Ephesians chapter four, verse two, what Paul does so clearly is he lays out four fundamentals that we can take and we can apply them to our lives. And as we are one big team, we can put them into our lives and we can drive ourselves towards one, unity. Let me read four, two for you one more time. See if you can catch them. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. 
I got them right here. First one's be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. And allow each other's faults. What we're going to talk about in group time tonight is these four fundamentals. We're going to unpack them and we're going to have these conversations about how we can take these things and we can apply them to our lives. But let me set them up for you real quick. Humility. Man, if there's one thing that we can all work on when it comes to humility, I thought through it this week and and this is the one I landed on. Man, how do we handle failure? When we mess up, I'm talking me personally too, the first thing that we think about sometimes is man, no, no, I, I meant to do that. When we fail, a lot of times it's really hard for us to go to somebody and be like, hey man, I'm sorry. I messed up there. I shouldn't have said that. We got to work on being humble, guys. We got to exercise humility. The second one, be gentle. Oh, this one is, is, I am so passionate about this one. You see, I was raised to be tough. I was raised to stand up for truth. You guys remember last year, 2020? I think a lot of us grew in this area of being gentle with how we approach each other. I mean, just think about it. Think about how we interacted with each other just because somebody had a different political view than us. Maybe somebody felt this way about wearing a mask or somebody felt this way about a vaccine and what did we do? We weren't very gentle. We took a hard stance on our truth and we forgot about what matters most. The third one, be patient. Man, we live in a world that we want something, we want it now, and if you can't give it to me, I'll go find somebody who can. That's not being one team. The last one, we over-criticize people when they fail or when they have a fault. And what Paul is saying or what he's challenging every single one of us to do is this. Man, when someone messes up, maybe they say something dumb on social media or you hear that they're talking about you behind your back, go have an honest, humble, gentle, patient conversation with that person. Don't give up on them. These are the four fundamentals we're gonna break down in group time tonight. But what Paul does next in this chapter, Ephesians 4, He goes on to verse 11, and this is what he says. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. What he's saying is that if we wanna be mature, if we all wanna grow individually and we wanna grow as a team, what he's saying is we gotta take these four fundamentals, humility, gentleness, patience, and we gotta apply them to our gifts. Because even though we're called to unity, he's not saying, hey, I want a bunch of robots walking around. We all have these special gifts that he talked about in verse 13. Some of us are athletes. Some of us are smart. Some of us, man, we're really good with kids. Some of us are great teachers and leaders. And what he's saying is, hey, I got these four fundamentals and work on these every single day just like you would in basketball, shooting free throws, baseball, fielding ground balls. Apply them to your gifts that have been given to you by God. And when we do that, we will grow and become mature. And we'll grow in unity, being close in one. It's that simple. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 4. 
And here's how I want to end tonight. I want everybody to stand up real quick. Everybody stand up. Kind of awkward, huh? And not only do I want you to stand up, I want you to link up with the person next to you. We do this all the time. Link up. I also want you to close your rows. If there's a row across from you, I want you, oh, yep, we're doing it. Let's be, do it quietly. Let's do it quietly. I'll give you 10 more seconds. All right. Everybody look around. Everybody look around. This is one team. Do you believe it? What Paul is saying from a prison in chapter four of Ephesians is he's challenging the people of Ephesus. And he's saying, hey, hey, quit being your own individual person trying to figure this thing out. Link up. Unify. Come together. And I want to end tonight with a couple challenges for every single one of you guys. Just like Paul, one of the head coaches of our faith, is doing to the churches of Ephesus. The first challenge is this. Man, some of you, maybe you just started coming to church. Maybe tonight's actually your first night. And you're sitting here, you're like, what the heck is going on? Who's Paul? Who's Jesus? What is going on? Here's my challenge for you. Keep showing up. You are welcomed here. This team needs you here. My second challenge is this. It's maybe you've been coming around a while. Maybe you've heard about Jesus in this free gift of God's grace. And as we've been in this Ephesians series, maybe you've been feeling this tap on your shoulder. And you're like, hey, I want to, I kind of want that free gift. If that's you in the room tonight, my challenge for you is to join the team. It's not something you have to try out for. It's a free gift. And this team needs you. My third challenge is for the majority of us. Maybe at camp you made a decision to join the team and follow Jesus. And maybe you're sitting here and you're realizing, man, I have this free gift and what I've done is I've stuffed it in my pocket. It's become this like insurance policy. When I need it, I use it. But what Paul is challenging the people of Ephesus and what he's challenging us to do tonight is to get off the sidelines and help the team win. That's my challenge. Here's how I want to close us tonight. I just want you to think. Could you imagine what your school could look like? What this ministry could look like? What your family could look like? What your group could look like? What this church could look like? if this is how we interacted with each other. Even though we might not all be friends or have the same views, we linked up. And that's my challenge. I want every single one of you guys to know this. As one of your pastors on this team, I love being on the same team as you. And I am proud of every single one of you. What we're gonna do as we head off to groups is we're gonna remember these four fundamentals. 
being humble, being gentle, being patient, and not criticizing each other's faults. We're gonna apply them to our gifts, and we're gonna become a great team. Because if we wanna become a great team, we must find unity. Here's the main point. When we are unified, Jesus is glorified. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Okay. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for every student in this room. I thank you for this team. Father, I pray for the students that aren't here tonight because they are just as much a part of this team than anyone in this room. Father, as we head to groups tonight, just remind us that the way that we approach one another, the way that we interact with one another really matters. Not only for our own relationships, but also for people who don't know who you are, Lord. They want to see a church that loves each other, that pulls for each other. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hold up. I am all about this thing called instant application. You might want to be quiet because this is actually going to be really exciting for you guys. Instant application. Tonight I, I am pumped to announce to you, uh, I, over the years I've been approached by hundreds of you guys saying, man, why don't we like have a winter camp that we go to? Man, we should go to like a winter thing or we should have something we do in, in December or January. Well, when it comes to this team, we actually have an opportunity in January to link up because we're taking 400 people on our Rocky Point One mission trip in January. That's right. You can get excited about that. And here's what we're doing tonight. Here's a QR code on the screen right here. You can uh, go ahead and take a picture of that. But after group time tonight, I wanna to invite every single one of you, if you have any interest in going on this trip, we're gonna be having a Mexico launch party in building 4,000 right after group time. It's gonna be a quick 10 to 15 minute informational meeting where we're gonna give you all the details about the trip. This QR code will be there as well. We're gonna have some chips and salsa for you guys at some tables, and we will be in and out of there in 15 minutes. I want to build a team of 400 people and we're gonna go serve in unity in January. Hey, quick reminder, we do not have service next week, Halloween. You guys have fun with your friends, with your family. CCB students, Christ Center Difference Makers, you guys are awesome. I will see you at the Mexico launch party. You can head to group time. <laughs>